hand over to Michael to start his presentation. Okay, thank you, Antonella. Um, hi, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Today, I'm going to do a presentation on roof insulation as part of an upcoming series of SEI contractor training webinars. My name is Michael Lennon, and I work as a BER assessor and uh, across various uh, SEI schemes. And, and as we're currently working from home, like yourselves, this past few weeks, it's a good time to improve on quality of our work going forward. So the aim of this webinar would be to provide some guidance on roof insulation within the grant program. And as an inspector myself, um, this provides a good opportunity to share some of my learnings during inspections. And for you, it may be an opportunity to improve on quality that may help you in the future. And if getting it right the first time can avoid having to go back to do reworks, um, well, this will lead to happy customers. And overall, I think everyone will be happier with that. Um, so just to let you know before I start, you can submit any questions via the chat bubble at the bottom of your screen there. And myself and other members of the panel will try our best to answer any questions you may have at the end of the session. And any questions not answered today can be distributed at a later date. Now, so I'll proceed. Every guest will be automatically muted as I begin. So the agenda for today, we have an overview. We're going to talk a little bit about the climate action plan through to assessing the roof. Uh, and then relevant standards and specifications and regulations, uh, ensuring compliance from the start, sign off on completion and compliance, and we're going to chat a little bit about the inspection overview and some best practice items. So this presentation covers the standards required for attic insulation installation for Better Energy Homes grants with the aim to give a better understanding of the standard of works required under the SCI schemes, give guidance on the quality checklist for SEI roof insulation inspections, to highlight best practice to ensure a quality finish, and to highlight any potential issues or any common problems found. So a little bit about the background of the Climate Action Plan. As you know, it was published in 2019, and it recognizes that Ireland must significantly step up its commitments to tackle climate disruption. And it does set out an ambitious course of action over the coming years to address this issue. Uh, our homes use 7% more energy than EU on average, so this um, is a very worrying figure. And just this picture here on this slide, it's a good one I find to show to a homeowner. And you can ask them, uh, can you guess which roof has the better insulation? And you can see that the snow was melting on the roof there on the right-hand side. And it's clear that the uh, insulation isn't great on that particular roof. I just found this a good um, picture to show any homeowners that might be getting roof insulation. Um, so how does the Better Energy Home Scheme play a role? So it helps meet higher energy performance standards by increasing retrofit activity, improving the fabric of buildings, and this reduces the CO2 emissions. It sets out an ambitious course of action over the coming years. And building retrofits should aim to achieve a B2 BER, or cost optimal equivalent. And this, in turn, will improve our living standards by making our buildings more comfortable, healthier, and less costly to heat, which is what every homeowner would like to hear. So we're going to move on to assessing the roof. And in particular, we're going to chat about U-values, uh, roof types, and some insulation materials. So on roof insulation U-values, so what determines the U value? Well, it's basically the thermal conductivity of the material and the depth or thickness of the material that you're going to be using. And you can see from this illustration here that with the lower the U value, the less heat is going to be transferring through that particular product. And where you have the higher U value, the more heat is going to be transferring through. So there's different roof types require different new values, and we're going to chat a little bit about them further on. Um, but material selection is key, so the lower the thermal conductivity of the material and the better the performance will be. And the lower the U-value, the more heat retained within the, within the dwelling. So we need to maintain the U-value, especially on items like flooring and hatch. Sorry, I just go back to slide five. <laughs> 
sorry. Okay, so moving on to the next slide, uh, roof insulation due values. So for a pitch roof at ceiling level, uh, the scheme requirements are 0 0.16. And you can see we have four different materials here with different thermal conductivities. Um, and just highlighting that each, term, each material and the depths required for achieving the 0.16 of a U value at ceiling level. And we can see here the mineral wool that has a thermal conductivity of 0 0.044 would need 270 millimeters. And as we move down the lower thermal conductivities, uh, the less depth you need to be installing. So that just gives a kind of an outline of the type of different depths you need to be installing to meet that 1.16 of a U value. So we go through to pitched roofs, and this would be any roof that is greater than 15 degree pitch. So these would be generally practical at low cost of insulation. And common insulation materials would be mineral fiber, spray foam, or blown fiber. And rigid or semi-rigid insulation can be used. And the target scheme U value for insulation at ceiling level is 0.16. We move on to flat roofs, which would be a roof less than 15 degree pitch. And sometimes these are technically challenging to retrofit, but we're going to talk about two different types here. The first being cold deck, and this would be upgrading by adding high performance insulated plasterboard to the underside of the ceiling. Um, in this particular example, uh, cross ventilation must be installed or maintained. And there's a warm deck as well, and this was insulation can be installed with a new weatherproof covering at the top of the flat roof, and no ventilation upgrade would be required in this warm deck. So the target scheme U value for flat roofs is 0 0.22. Moving on to warm roofs where the insulation is at rafter level, and um, this would be where the uh, pitch roof is habitable areas with rooms. And the common materials would be mineral fiber, spray foam, rigid insulation, and there is an extra requirement for ventilation, so it's two and a half times more ventilation than a standard pitched roof. And you do need to have a 50 millimeter gap required behind the insulation on slopes. The target scheme U value would be at the rafters is 0.2. So on to dormer roofs, and these again are technically challenging because there's different types of methods. And because you want to be insulating on the warm roof, and ceiling level, and there's wall insulation as well. Um, again, there's two and a half times more ventilation required than a pitched roof, and you still need to have that 50 millimeter gap behind the insulation on the slopes. The vertical dormer walls should be insulated to the same standards as the rafters. The scheme target U value, insulation of rafters is 0.2, and insulation at ceiling level is 0.16. So we're going to move on to insulation materials, and we'll start with the mineral fiber on the wool quilt. Um, you would place the, typically place the first layer between the joists, and this is dependent on the thickness of the joist and any presence of any existing insulation. And then your additional insulation would be placed above the first layer and across the joists. And the thermal conductivity for a common, this common material would be 0.044. And you would really need to be installing around 300 millimeters, which would give you a value that exceeds the scheme um, requirements of 0 0.13. Onto a thermal rigid board, um, insulation is placed either between or below the rafters or both. Um, you need a vapor control layer, and this should be placed between the plasterboard and the insulation. For foil back insulation, foil taping of the joints between the slabs will fulfill the requirement for a vapor control layer. And a thermal conductivity would be around 0 0.025. Now the thermal conductivities will de be dependent on your actual material and might vary from this figure. And for blown fiber or cellulose, um, it can be a quick and installation method, but sometimes can re result in uneven installation. Uh, the roof space should really be cleared of obstructions to ensure a uniform thickness throughout. And it should, um, precautions should be made for, uh, for the adequate roof ventilation. You can see here the eave ventilation spacer trays are installed. And this is 
um, key to providing good ventilation to these roof spaces. And the thermal conductivity would be roughly around 0 0.046, and you would need the 300 millimeters depth to achieve 0.13. Now on to spray foam. Again, it's a quick installation method, and is useful where there's access to certain areas are very restricted. Um, precautions regard, regarding adequate roof ventila ventilation would be as as NSAI certificate. You can see here that the soffit vent, um, there's a gap here of continuous 25 millimeter to allow the air to come up. And you can see that this air would come up behind the installation of the spray foam, uh, leaving your 50 millimeter gap behind that installation. The NSAI certificate should be provided to the homeowner as well. And the thermal conductivity would be roughly about 0 0.028 for this type of material. Now, we'll move on to roof insulation standards and specifications. Now, as you might be aware, there's um, support available for contractors. Um, the quality of service delivery is central to reputation and effectiveness of all home energy works supported by SEI. So you could click on to www.sei.ie and if you go on to the grant section and supports for contractors you'll find these documents available here so the domestic technical standards and specifications there's the better energy homes contractors code of practice there's the quality assurance and disciplinary procedures for the contractors and then there's sr54 and this really is a very useful document when it comes to retrofitting homes it really provides all the information you would need um, for the uh, retrofit of dwellings and it gives some uh, background about insulation materials and different methods and how to install them. Uh, there's other supports available. Um, you can see that on the SEI website under the supports for contractors. Um, that's available along with reworks the P form. And I just want to point out that all registered contractors must ensure that they and their operators are fully familiar with the quality assurance and discipline of procedures, and all work should be carried out in accordance with the relevant specifications, best practice, and technical guidance documents. So we're just going to move on now to Part L of the uh, building regulations, um, the new Part L, conservation of fuel and energy in dwellings. So this just provides methodology for the calculation of the energy performance of buildings. Um, it sets minimum energy performance requirements for buildings and ensures that when buildings undergo major renovation, the energy performance of the building is upgraded in order to meet the minimum energy performance requirements. So what is the major, major renovation? Well, the major renovation means the renovation of a dwelling where more than 25% of the surface of the dwelling envelope undergoes renovation. So, the, for example, the surface area of the dwelling envelope are all the elements through which the building can lose heat to the external environment. So, your, for example, your heat loss area of the walls, windows, um, floors, and roof. So these are the areas you'd be taking into account for major renovation. So the qualifying elemental works are external wall insulation and internal insulation, where greater than 25% of the surface area of the dwelling envelope is renovated. The cost optimal performance level is to be achieved, and this is really a B2 rating for the dwelling. Um, the attic insulation works um, upgrades are not themselves considered a major renovation, but the attic works such um, in a major renovation would contribute to the cost optimal level to be achieved. Now, we'll move on to insurance compliance. So ensuring compliance, the first thing really what you want to be doing when you arrive on site is assessing the roof. Um, there may be more, there may be multiple roof types in the dwelling and access for each roof individually and recommend to the customer the most appropriate actions to achieve the whole house solution is what we're looking for. Um, then you'd, your discussions with the homeowner, you'd really want to be providing your professional advice on your installation methods and how they might in, impact the homeowner. And for example, if you were installing additional roof tile ventilation, uh, the roof tiles might impact on the look of the house. And it really would be part of your homeowner discussions before you start any work. Um, if there was any other areas that might be only providing only part element coverage, um, for instance, a wardrobe or anything restricting 
um, insulation on the rafters, then you'd really want to be just uh, discussing this with the homeowner uh, as well, because they might be happy enough to remove the, the wardrobe or whatever. Now, so moving on to specifying the works required to achieve compliance. So inform the customer of the performance standards of their products and how they will be installed to comply with the same specifications. Um, issuing detailed written quotation to the homeowner, um, you'd really want to be providing a measure by measure breakdown specifying all costs of works and you lay it out in a clear and easy to read manner for someone who mightn't be avail um, and familiar with those type of works. Um, you could include itemized material lists, including labor and VAT, and the method by which you would be paid as well, that would be included there. Um, and then a sense you'd be re uh, reaching an agreement with the homer, which is essentially your contract. Um, a written contract should be provided clearly stating that the works will comply with the grant requirements and will cover the cost of potential reworks uh, where these may be required by SCI to remedy any non-compliances. And there is a, a model contract available on the SEI website as well. Now, um, sign off on completion and compliance. So you all will be familiar with the declaration of the works form. So this needs to be filled out by the homeowner, contractor, and be your assessor for each measure, measure and submitted to SEI for grant payment. You want to be making sure that you have the correct date on the declaration of works. If there's any other documentation uh, to clarify or demonstrate compliance, you want to be including that. And you can also note in the comment box at the bottom there. If there's any part element coverage achieved, this also must be detailed in the declaration of works. And any justification for any part element coverage must be put in there at the comment section. I'm just going to go through uh, an example of filling out the declaration of works for roof insulation. So all dwelling roof types must be, clicked, must be ticked. For each dwelling roof type, enter the percentage of works completed before and after. Enter the average insulation thickness for U value and for the roof. And there is guidelines for estimating the U value for roofs prior to the Better Energy Homes works, and they're provided on the second page of the declaration, the work form. Um, you have to enter the area of roof insulated by yourself in meters squared. And if any area is less than 100%, you have to include just your justification for, for that. So moving on to inspection, overview, and best practice. So um, some houses are selected for an inspection. And just to let you know that inspectors have a predefined list of items to look out for. And we're going to have a couple of pictures and examples further on here, which we'll run through separately. But the type of areas we look at are outlined here. So we kind of look at the area installed for the overall whole house solution. Um, the insulation depth, uh, when we enter the roof space, we're then looking at the pipework, the walk boards, the hatch insulation, uh, water storage tanks. We look at the ventilation and any electrical items and the insulation specification itself. And then we're just going to provide some additional best practice items that you might um, want to be familiar with. Um, and to let you know that checklists for the energy efficient upgrades are available in Appendix 2 of the Quality Assurance and Disciplinary Procedures. We would really um, encourage people to download and snag their own work before you sign the Declaration of Works form. So if you can just imagine yourself as inspector, before you um, sign the Declaration of Works, you could just snag your own work and you might save yourself a visit back to the house. So we'll move on to insulation area installed here. So the contractor must ensure that an optimal whole house solution is provided. And I have an example below here um, where the attic over the garage area should not be insulated as it is unheated area, but the attic over the utility room should be insulated and is, as it is heated and located within the thermal envelope of the dwelling. So you can see, um, just to highlight this type of scenario here, that it would be best not to, to not insulate the um, utility room, not to forget to insulate the utility room. There may be a, an additional hatch required to get to this utility room, but that could be part of your discussions with the homeowner. So insulation area installed, again, we have another example um, where the dwelling has a smaller attic B to the rear of the dwelling. And this is to achieve a whole house solution um, and the attic should be insulated if the room below is heated and located within the thermal envelope of the dwelling. 
and if the smaller roof space is accessible. So just to point out again, if you have a small little area to the rear of the dwelling that is accessible, um, not to forget to insulate that one as well. So the insulation depth installed as the specification, and as you know, the target U value for the scheme at, at ceiling level is 0.16, and the depth to, to be achieved here is 300 millimeters where you're using um, mineral fiber. Um, and where there are multiple attics with varying depths, each attic must be topped up to 300 millimeters. That will give you around 0.16. And multiple depths of insulation may be required in the same attic. So you can see here for a flat roof, the target U value is 0.22. And for the ceiling follow insulation, where the ceiling is following the pitch of the roof, the target is 0.20. So moving on to pipe insulation, and you can just see as well the domestic technical standards and specifications section 6.4.2. There's more uh, information available there about the insulation of pipework. So in an attic, all pipes containing mortar, mortar must be insulated. All sections of pipework must be insulated, and that's including any bends or any valves and joints. Insulation must be correctly fitted and secured. And there is further guidance available in Appendix Table 1 in Part G of the Building Regulations. And I'll just run through a quick example here um, where the minimum thickness of insulation required. So if there was a 20.2 millimeter diameter of pipe, and if you knew your pipe insulation conductivity to be 0 0.035, um, you would need 23 millimeters of insulation on that particular example. So that's not very practical because I, I don't think um, people are going to know the thermal conductivity of the pipe insulation all of the time. So there is a rule of thumb that if the wall thickness should be greater than the diameter of, of the pipe. So that's kind of an easier way to do it. You can see here where there's 18 millimeter pipe in both examples and the nine millimeter insulation would really do. You have to be going with um, 22 millimeter insulation. Yeah, so it's really the thicker insulation that you want to be using for the pipe insulation. So where the wall of thickness should be greater than the diameter of the pipe. So we'll move on to some poor workmanship examples. And you can see in these examples here, the joint fittings are poor and not insulated. It, there's really a risk of freezing here as a, it's going to be colder in the attic after insulating upgrades. So you really need to be sure that the joint fittings are insulated correctly. This is a good workmanship example where the correct pipe insulation techniques are very important to ensure joints and bends are fully covered and sealed. And you can see this is just a perfect way to do it. You spring the insulation into the pipe and where the technique on the bend, you notch out. And then on the elbows, you mitra and where you butt into the teeth joints. Very good example how it's done. Again, some poor workmanship examples where the incorrectly sized and poor pipe insulation is fitted there. And you can see that on this second picture, the pipes in the attic are not insulated or below the quilt. So if the pipes are running less than 300 millimeters from the ceiling, then it's definitely possible to insulate the pipes by running the quilt insulation over the pipes. These are good workmanship examples where the joints are fully covered and sealed. Good quality of insulation is used throughout and the pipes are sealed the whole way into the tank. So that's exactly where, what we're looking for during an, an inspection. Now on to walk boards. Um, these are required for safe access in a roof space. Um, and the minimum thickness would be 80 millimeters and 450 millimeters wide of flooring grade chipboard. And these must be screwed fixed to the joist uh, and have to start and finish on a joist and should not compress the insulation beneath. Um, why are the work boards required? Well, they have to safe access to the items here. So anything like water tanks, specifically the ball valves of the tanks, any solar PV inverters, solar pumping stations, any storage areas that might be in the attic, any mechanical ventilation systems that might be located in the attic, um, light switches as well, if they're not close to the hatch, you'd want to be accessing them via a walk board. And then you might have some gas boilers sometimes in the attic that need to be assessed by a walk board. And we have some work, work, workmanship examples here. This is actually an inspection I was on myself, where this walk board here 
was actually put down at a later date by the homeowner after the contractor had left. And the reason being is because if you might see in the image there, there's a light switch just right there. And what the homeowner needed to do to access the light switch, the first thing they did to switch on the light when they get into the attic. So it just highlights the fact that if there was a walkboard going there, it would have been safely installed rather than the homeowner just uh, loosely putting down a walkboard that mightn't be safe. Um, this particular example, uh, the walkboard is 300 millimeters, which is too narrow. Um, in this particular example as well, the, the walkboard is parallel with the joist. So there's a risk there of the walkboard um, wobbling from side to side. Um, the walkboard should really be installed across the joist in a safe manner. And this is what we're looking for. So the correct width of walkboard supported and fixed to the joist and accessing the full area of the tank there. So some more poor workmanship examples. We see here where there's a styro ladder and the walkboard should really be accessible to the top of the ladder. Just like the second image here where it shows the, the walkboard uh, run to the landing edge of this fixed ladder. So basically most of us are, who are in attics often are quite familiar of the risks involved in assessing certain areas. But for homeowners uh, possibly who are elderly, um, they're not experienced and an attic can be a dangerous place where falls could occur. So as you can see from the first image, the walkboard is not accessible directly from the hatch. And this kind of would be dangerous for someone who climbing up a ladder and who have to turn around to get to the to the walkboard. Second image is what we're looking for, uh, where the walkboard is just at the top of the ladder there, and it's easy accessible to the storage area, you can see there, and the light switch there as well. So it's kind of what we're looking for. Now, some other workmanship you see here, where there's no walkboard uh, to the ventilation unit in the attic. And as a BER assessor, these are the type of items that we need to be getting over to to um, get the information on. So we'd really be wanting the walk, walkboard all the way over to the items like that there um, and any other serviceable items in the attic. And this is exactly what we're looking for, the walkboard uh, accessing the full length of the attic down to the tanks so you can easily get there. Um, some other poor workmanship here on the left uh, where the walkboard is fitted directly to the joists. Uh, there's no buttons fitted to raise the walkboard and the insulation is compressed beneath. And this is a good example here where the walkboards are built up off the joist correctly, so not compressing the insulation beneath. So we move on to hatch insulation, and these must be insulated to the same standard as the rest of the attic. So we'll run through some insulation types. So we have mineral wool. So to the same standard of the rest of the attic, we require around 300 millimeters, like the rest of the attic. If you're using a different insulation like Aeroboard, you'd need uh, a slightly less depth, would be around 225 millimeters. And if you're using a polyurethane rigid insulation, you'd need less depth again, so around 150 millimeters depth. And all of these different materials uh, provide a basic U value of around 0.16, which is what we're looking for. Now, this example of um, draft proofing on hatches, um, this is a good compression, and the compression must be maintained. And there's alternatives available, like this one here, uh, to the common hooks and eyes. And the compression of the hatches is becoming more and more important in buildings as we find that hatches with poor compression will result in a poor air tightness result. So that's just highlights the importance of why good compression is required on the hatch. Now, where there's access ladders are presenting maintain, um, maintaining insulation depth. It may not be practical, but some effort should be made to install some level of insulation. This example where the, the ladder was coming down, sometimes it can be very difficult to get insulation depths that you're looking for behind it. So if you can do some, some level of insulation on those. And where hatches are presenting difficult to install draft proofing from the bottom of the hatch, some effort should be made to install some level of draft proofing. So when you have kind of a hatch like this here, sometimes it's hard to get your draft roofing installed, but you could always go with different types of draft roofing, then possibly to stick on draft roofing, as long as you have it draft roofed. So we move on to some poor workmanship on hatches that we might come across. This particular example here, the at insulation depth is measuring less than 200 millimeters, which wouldn't be the standard. 
and, and the hatch insulation here is not covering the whole of the hatch at the edge as you can see the area there that it's missing it should really be covering all of the um, area of the hatch again some poor workmanship here where there's no hooks and eyes installed and this can lead to excessive drafts into the dwelling from the ventilated roof space so especially if there's extra roof ventilation being installed in the roof space and um, there will be even more drafts up there on the roof so which is why you need some sort of good compression on the hatch um, and hooks and eyes in this example are not installed to standard and um, we're leaving just good just poor compression there on that so you'd want to be just making sure that they're installed correctly um, some good workmanship examples, so an insulated hatch can be polyurethane or fibre or similar as long as it meets the standards. It doesn't matter what insulation you use as long as it meets standards. And in this example here, the hooks and eyes were installed to standards resulting in good compression, which is what we, we check when we're doing an inspection. There's other methods to insulate attic hatches and you could use an insulating hood or lightweight insulating box. And there's a good image here, images here, where the pictures indicate the temperature difference where an attic hood is installed and where it's not installed. So you can see here where the attic hood is installed, is not installed. Uh, the temperature difference is quite um, significant and it's colder here, um, looking, highlighting the fact that there's heat being lost through this hood. And you can see here where it is installed, the temperature is the same as the rest of the ceiling there and it's well insulated. But there's other methods available. Uh, moving on to water storage tank insulation and insulating the roof at ceiling level will mean that the air temperature within the roof file will be close to external temperatures. So you can see this image here uh, from SR54. It's a good one because it shows where the water tanks are close to ceiling level uh, and then the insulation is left clear to the underside of the tank um, just to, to allow the heat from below to prevent the tank from freezing um, and then all other surfaces of the tank are insulated along with the pipework and um, so to prevent water from freezing insulation should not be placed below the tank but lapped up at the sides and around it and any raised tanks should be insulated as normal and all surfaces of the tank insulated separately so this is an example here for a water storage tank that had less than 300 millimeters from the ceiling um, the tank is to be insulated to the side and the lid. Um, no insulation fitted to the underside and no insulation between the joists under the tank. And you can see here this example with the quilt is skirted up just around the underside of the tank, which is exactly what we're looking for again. So where the supported storage tank is more than 300 uh, millimeters from the joist, so where you have your raised storage tanks, um, the tank is to be insulated throughout the including the underside here and um, insulate the attic fully at ceiling level so you can see there's good insulation put underneath um, the tanks where it's raised so some poor workmanship examples you can see here that the tank insulation is not held in place and in this example here there's no insulation or there's no lid fitted as well um, good workmanship so what we're looking for is the tanks to be fully insulated throughout insulation correctly taped and tied in place and the insulation lids fitted so this is a, an example of an installation of a water tank insulation where the contractor installed supports for the lid uh, to prevent the insulation from weighing down on the ball valve so you can see here having the correct supports for the lid could prevent you from another call out um, to fix an issue of a, a ball valve overflowing so that's just a good example there Moving on to ventilation in the roof space. So this is necessary to remove the water vapor and to prevent harmful condensation. Ventilation becomes more important with the increase of the quality of the insulation used. And condensation penetrates rafters causing moisture content to rise. And this creates ideal conditions for dry rot and is a fungus which can germinate and spread in these conditions. So it just highlights the importance of ventilation in the roof space. So how do we ventilate an attic? Um, so where there is no insulation or an additional top off is required, new attic insulation may lead to condensation and therefore a continuous gap of 10 millimeters or equivalent ventilation should be installed. 
This would provide good cross ventilation and avoid creating pockets of stagnant air. In such cases, the ventilation provision for the dwelling should be checked. And you can see here, there's low level ventilation example here uh, on a pitched roof. Ventilation is installed at eaves level with a continuous gap of 10 millimeters or equivalent on the longest side of the roof in order to achieve that cross ventilation. And the eaves level ventilation can be installed in the form of soffit ventilators or as tile slate ventilators uh, if the soffit is unsuitable. Uh, on to high level ventilation, some cases uh, where the pitch exceeds 35 degrees, you may, you will need to install high level ventilation and as well when the span of the roof from wall plate to wall plate is greater than 10, mm, uh, 10 meters. Um, and where you have, where you need to install high level ventilation, an equivalent of five millimeters wide strip running continuously along the length of the ridge is required. So for a lean to or a mono pitch roof, this is where the roof uh, has a single slope and abuts the wall. And uh, this type of roof should have ventilations opening at eaves and high level. And the ventilation at high level may be arranged through the roof coverings and should be placed as high as practical. The aerial high level should be at least two continuous ventilation running the full length of the junction at five millimeters wide. We're just going to run through a simple example here of a standard rectangular dwelling where the eaves length is seven meters and there was no other existing ventilation. So therefore the ventilation for this roof would be, so you start by converting the seven meters into millimeters. So you'd have 7,000 millimeters on the rear and 7,000 millimeters on the front, which would be 14,000 millimeters. And you multiply this 14,000 millimeters by the 10 millimeters continuous strip that we talked about. And this gives you your 140,000 millimeters squared of ventilation requirement. So that's just a basic example of uh, installing ventilation on the longest side of the roof um, and the example of how to calculate it. So as well, there's, um, moving on to new ventilation guidance for pitched roofs. So you might may be aware that SR54 has a, a new ventilation guidance. And this is an attic ventilation assessment should be carried out if all of the following conditions are verified. Additional roof ventilation is not required. So this new guidance essentially says that if you meet certain conditions that you do not have to install, install any additional ventilation requirements. So these conditions are if you have at least 100 millimeters of existing insulation on the ceiling between the joists, if you have the existing insulation is good condition, uh, like no gaps around the joists or incomplete sections, if you're happy that there's no evidence of the following, uh, any signs of mold, moisture, or any signs of large droplets of condensation. So if you're happy that there's no evidence of the, those, you don't, um, if you meet the rest of the conditions, you don't need to install any additional roof ventilation as per the new guidance in SR 54 2019. So moving on to ventilation and some poor workmanship examples. In this example here, you can see that the eaves ventilation is blocked, just right here. And the rafter is showing signs of rotting due to condensation in the roof space. So it's very important to uh, maintain your um, ventilation at the eaves. Uh, on this example here, the saturation of insulation is transferred through the plasterboard ceiling, causing mold growth. And this causes health issues for occupants. Other examples of poor workmanship here, uh, the eaves were left clear, but may blow closed over the, the time removing the ventilation. And this is good workmanship in this scenario. We're installing the protection at the eaves. Maintaining ventilation is a good requirement for these products. Now on to some other examples of poor workmanship where you have extractor, extractor fans piped to eaves, but not to outside. So if you have uh, an extractor fan in a wet room, it really needs to be ducted to an outside source rather than just ducting it into the roof space um, where all the moisture would be coming into. So it has to go out to an outside source um, in some instances, you might come across where the extractor fan is covered by insulation, and this would really be part of your initial assessment of the roof. Uh, and you want to be really highlighting this to the homeowner as well, that you may have additional condensation in the roof space and that you may need to um, 
ducted to an outside and it may cost extra. So it could be part of your initial assessment of the roof. And extractor fans not piped to the outside and was covered by insulation. So this is just another example um, where the fan that you see there in the ceiling was covered by insulation when I entered the roof space. So as an inspector, we would be just looking out for those fans in wet rooms and we'd be checking to see that they're ducted to an outside source. Moving on to electrical items in the roof space and specifically recess lights. Recess lights. Um, should be provided with sufficient space to prevent from overheating. And this is why um, special consideration must be taken for recessed lights. Um, a void should be formed around the light fitting at the lowest insulation layer, where the light fitting itself is not airtight to the roof, or where it is not possible to make the ceiling airtight, then an airtight enclosure should be formed, just as you can see here in this image from SR54. So some examples of some poor workmanship. You can see here in this image that the void should be formed around the light fishing and should be protected. And on this image here, you can see that there's insulation visible directly behind the recessed light there, which is, we, um, could cause problems with overheating. Some examples of good workmanship. So what you really want to be doing first is cleaning the area thoroughly in the roof space. Um, applying grip adhesive to the entire rim of a protective cover, pushing down to seal it, and then you want to be just applying a little bit of further adhesive to seal it for air tightness, and then the unit can be covered with insulation and safely with the thermal uh, material. Note as well, just the LED lights are treated the same as halogen lamps, and they still need to be protected as well. Moving on to electrical penetration items. So this, this six square and larger heavy duty cables shown in the image here are not to be covered by insulation. So these cables can heat and result in fire. And it's good practice to pull cables over the insulation. And these are generally mains cables, cooker cables, and electric shower cables. And if cables are running through the joist, then you'd really want to be pulling the insulation back from these cables. A note, just check for electric shower on cooker cables prior to attic insulation installation, as these appliances require heavy duty cables and may not have an incorrect cable installed, making them more dangerous to be covered. So as an inspector, again, I would, just before I enter the roof space, I would check the cooker cables and electric shower cables, and if they're present, and I would be looking out for those when I enter the roof space. So some poor workmanship would be what we see here with the heavy duty electrical cables shown are covered by insulation. And if we move to good workmanship, this is exactly what I'd look to see. Uh, the heavy duty electrical cables shown are all lifted on top of the insulation. This is what we'd be looking out for. So moving on to insulation as per specification. And you can see here in this image at the edge of the eaves, the first layer of the insulation is not addressed during the install. And you can see with the, the area of the plasterboard there is really, this is what happens when you miss this area. Um, mold will form on the, root, on the ceiling beneath. You really want to be ensuring that insulation is pushed all the way out to the wall plate, but you'd re, uh, you have to ensure that adequate soft ventilation is man, maintained while you do that. So, First insulation layer on this image here is, is not cut between joists, but it's, it's, raised, it's cut um, across them. It should really be cut between the joists, and then your additional layer should be fitted on top and perpendicular to the joists. And if you're using this material fiber, you should um, have a level of 300 millimeters in total. Now we'll move on to some best practice items. Um, this is just an image that you might have come across yourselves um, where the homeowners like to use their roof space for additional storage. It's quite common and you really want to be stressing to the homeowner that if you're going to be insulating your attic, then it'd probably be, to be best to clear your storage out of the attic and to provide a purpose um, storage area so the insulation wouldn't be um, compromised beneath. So that would really be part of your assessment as well. And that's something that you could mention to the homeowner that you could provide a storage area. Um, it's a measure that could be installed for each property. 
that requires it. And but if it's been installed, the at ceiling level should not compromise the insulation beneath and should have the same U value as 0.16. And um, it may be constructed with counter joists accommodating the full depth of insulation and a decking. And um, it could also have high performance insulation and could be placed on top of the ceiling joist in the form of an insulated flooring. Um, but the method will be left up to yourselves, the contractors, um, in accordance with some um, SR54 guidance. There's some good guidance on storage areas there in section 6.3.2.4. And the storage area should really be installed um, close to the loft hatch as possible um, and accessible from a walkway, as we mentioned earlier on the walkway section. On to feed and expansion pipes. So uh, the feed and expansion pipes should be extended into the feed and expansion tanks. Um, situations sometimes arise where the contractor has not extended the inspection pipe properly into the tank. In some cases, the pipe insulation might be used to extend the expansion pipe into the tank and not the pipe itself. And in other situations, a square might be just cut out of the tank. Um, these approaches would be, wouldn't be accessible as there is no guarantee that if the water boils, that the water will actually enter the tank without spilling out. So they really need to be extended with a suitable product and a suitable joint like copper. And the pipe should be terminated below the lid of the tank, but not below the water line. We'll just move on to some pure workmanship here. You can see in this image that the feed and expansion pipes are not extended into the tank. And this is actually a job I was on myself. And you might notice there that there's signs of water on the tank insulation there. And um, this particular example, the water was overflowing down on top of the insulation at ceiling level and uh, leaking down onto the ceiling below that. And it was actually staying in the plasterboard. So it might save you um, a trip back out if it was suitably extended into the tank. And some other examples here where you can see that the pipe isn't exactly extended down the full way into the tank on both of these images. So some good workmanship. You can see these two images. And um, the feed and expansion pipes are fully extended into the tank and terminated below the lid of the tank, but not below the water line. And we move on to insulation guarantees in attic. So an insulation guarantee must be clearly visible in the attic. And I should outline, outline the following. The homeowner and installer name, address, and contact details. The insulation installation details, uh, including the date, the type of material installed, the area installed, and the total thickness installed, including the signature from yourselves as well. Um, and as a BER assessor, um, when entering the roof space, we look, just the first thing I look out for just what type of material is installed and what depths are installed and it's the type of thing I would take a photo of as well just to have on file and it's quite professional as well when you see your um, whole insulation details in the roof space. So again warning signs best practice so it really would be best practice in, to install a minimum of two warning signs in each attic insulated and these should be clearly visible indicating that the roof joists are covered with insulation material and it may be unsafe to enter the attic. So for so someone who's not familiar with entering uh, roof spaces like homeowners, um, to just have these warning signs would be beneficial to them just so they wouldn't be standing in any areas that uh, might be unsafe. So that's it. That brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your time and I hope you found my presentation interesting. And if I could remind you that you have any further questions or queries, you can submit them via the chat bubble at the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our best to get to them. Okay, we might proceed now to answer a few questions. Uh, I might hand you over to my colleagues to make a start on them. Antonella, are you are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm there. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Great. So, um, yeah, on the questions. There's, um, first of all, there's a general one we got about deep retrofit and uh, what what grants are available to a homeowner who would like um, to um, do deep, extensive renovations. So 
the deep right of its skin is closed at the moment, and we have no other indication on it, but all the Better Energy Homes grants are available to homeowners. Uh, in terms of um, then questions more related to roof insulation, we have um, we have one about the overflow pipe. Do you insulate the overflow pipe? And Matt, you might want to answer this one. Yeah, just to come back, that was Gerard asked that question. So Gerard, we, it's good practice to insulate it, but because there's no water normally in the pipe, we wouldn't expect people that to, to insulate it. So we, we'd never go back as part of our inspection. It's not a, it's not a check that we have because what we advise people is water containing pipes, any pipe that holds water to make sure that they're insulated. Right. And uh, there's another question uh, still on pipe insulation on the vent pipe. Um, what level does it have to be fully insulated or can it be insulated only to the water level? That, that's Jason's question that came in there. It's a good question. Technically, for a vent pipe, which is the expansion pipe that's like a, a shepherd's hook that goes over the top of the tank, technically there's only water in that pipe up to the water level of the tank. Now, personally, I'd always advise people to, to insulate all of it because um, if you're not from a plumbing background or know the mechanics of how that pipe works, it can be a little bit tricky to, to know where to stop the pipe or where to stop the pipe insulation. If it's done all the time, technically you never get it wrong. But our inspectors, if they're calling to site and it is insulated up as far as the water level of the pipe, well then we we'll certainly won't ask anyone to return to site to do any reworks on it. But I think it's just best practice to get into the habit of insulating all of the vent pipe normally. Okay. That's great. And uh, we have a time for a few uh, more questions. Um, okay. The other side of static, does this need to be insulated if the tank is at a joist level? Matt, I don't know if you want to take this one. Uh, the underside of okay, if the tank is at joist level, no, it doesn't require insulation. And Michael alluded to it there in his presentation. So the idea is, is that the heat from the space goes up and keeps the bottom of the tank warm. But that heat should only heat the bottom of the tank. So if the tank is over 300 millimeters from the joist level, we would say it's, it, there's, there's no point in trying to do that. So insulate the bottom of the tank and insulate underneath it. But if the tank is sitting on the joist or very close to it, it's good practice to leave out a piece of insulation, just to allow a little bit of heat up to keep that tank and stop it from freezing and not in the, insulate the underside of the tank. But as I say, it's only where it's within 300 millimeters of a joist. Great. So there's, um, we have time for a few more questions. Uh, is, if the heaps are blocked, uh, Matt, with existing insulation, do I have to unblock them? Yeah, it's good practice. Even with the changes that have been made to SR54, we'd still recommend that the eaves are always unblocked as well too, so as not to, to block them, unless, of course, there is um, roof vent tiles. So if there's roof vent tiles installed, then it's, it, it, the eaves can be blocked. And that helps to get rid of it, the thermal bridge where the junction of the ceiling and the wall meets as well too. But only if, only if the um, only if there's no ventilation coming from the soffit. So okay. So uh, then another question okay, for for Martin on the um, uh, trapped ordnance on the hatch door um, is is it okay to use fiberglass to insulate the back of the hatch? Martin, I think you might be on mute. Yeah. Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah. yeah, it is okay to insulate the, the attic hatch with killed insulation as long as the, the, the required U value of 0.16 is achieved and uh, the insulation is not compressed and it extends to the perimeter of the, of the hatch. Okay. 
question. The other question, which is more general, I'll take this one, is is there going to be a link for the presentation or for later viewing? And the answer is yes, we're planning on circulating a link uh, to all attendees to uh, view the presentation again. Um, okay. Another question, actually, on, on the eaves blocked by existing installation is format. Uh, what if you install roof vents? Do you still require to unblock the eaves ventilation in that case? No, if the roof, if the roof tile vents and they're above the insulation, well then no, um, there, there, there's no requirement to unblock the eaves. Yeah. Um, then. Um, there's uh, another one is with the Matt with the new update to SR54 on ventilation. What should an installer do if some of the insulation is below 100 millimeters? So basically, there's existing insulation, but some of it is below 100 millimeters and some of it is above 100 millimeters. Um, we 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 we'd advise to the air, to err on the side of caution if that's the case. So if portions of the um, roof space are below 100 millimetres, we would say take the lowest depth and use that as a gauge. Obviously, if it's only very small portions, you know, if you're talking 5% of the overall attic, but if it's a significant portion of the attic has less than 100 mil, we would say ventilate as per normal. Okay. So, um... Sorry, just uh, I'm just reading the questions. Um, there's one about space. There's uh, the one that we understand what Matt is saying. Um, oh, if no ventilation is required, then okay. So I think the question is. If there has been an assessment in accordance to the uh, SR54 guidelines and no extra ventilation is required, then in that case, uh, do existing eaves have to be unblocked? What we would say is maintain whatever existing ventilation is there. So SR54 doesn't reference um, it, it, it doesn't reference ventilation quantities on it, but if there are, if there is existing ventilation, it shouldn't be compromised. And we would say, look, it's good practice, even if it has been blocked, just to unblock the eaves on it. And obviously, when you're unblocking the eaves, just to be careful not to pull it too far back that you leave part of the ceiling space exposed, because we've seen it there in Michael's presentation. Cold spots on a roof can lead to condensation and um, mold growth in the future. Yeah. So as part of time at this stage, there's uh, another question on the depth of spray foam insulation required at rafter level. I suppose spray foam's a that tricky one. Really, really yeah. depends on the spray insulation. Depends on the thermal material. conductivity of the product. Yeah. It, it also depends on guidance. Yeah, and there's guidance in the agreement certificate yeah. certificate also regarding thickness of insulation required. I don't know if you want to add anything. To uh, I can add to, to that one. It, it, as you said, it, there is guidance available in an NSI, NSAI certificate at the end of the certificate. But um, the example used on the presentation, the depth of spray foam required at rafter level was, I think it was 240 millimeters on that particular example. But again, just reference your own NSAI certificate and it should get the required depth for to achieve the, the correct U value. I'm not sure. Okay, great. So I think we'll wrap up at this stage. And thanks very much to uh, everybody who has uh, attended the presentation. And thanks a lot to uh, Michael to present to have you know presented and all the other panelists. Um, so we're going to circulate the link to 
uh, to the video so that you, you can uh, have, uh, you know, you can look, watch it again. Okay, so um, we'll just uh, conclude now and thanks a lot to everybody.